Hey guys, welcome to another Rise of Flight video. In this one, we're going to be uh, flying as Manfred von Richthofen. And just to give you a little bit of history, uh, this campaign starts in uh, September of 1916. And uh, von Richthofen um, actually was born to a noble family, what is now uh, in what is now known as uh, Poland. Uh, and the Baron title. Uh, it wasn't his first name, it was actually a nobility title. And uh, I guess the males in his family would go by Baron, uh, just to st set them apart. So von Richthofen joined, uh, he actually went to um, some sort of youth military program uh, at 11 years old. And then uh, he actually joined the cavalry uh, during World War One. He fought in a few uh, battles on different fronts. <coughs> And then um, it, it was a, I guess, horse-mounted uh, cavalry. His unit was uh, kind of uh, dissolved because in trench warfare they didn't see a need for horse reconnaissance. Uh, so then he was actually transferred over to a supply unit. And he wrote a letter to, I guess, his commanding officer <laughs> stating that he wasn't, he didn't join the military to uh, take care of eggs and milk or something to that effect, and he actually got uh, uh, transferred over to the air service. He started off flying the Albatross C-3, which is a two-seat bomber, uh, and then he he downed his first aircraft uh, in early 1916, and then he joined JASTA-2 and started flying the Albatross uh, D-2. In the Albatross, uh, he was credited with his most famous victory, uh, was the and this is depicted actually in the movie Flyboys, where he downs the Airco DH-2 flown by Major Hawker. And in the movie, they actually show him uh, crash. I guess the Airco had crashed into uh, on a railroad or something, and Von Richthofen goes out and checks out the uh, body and takes a souvenir from the aircraft. So this is the very beginning, uh, and that actually happened on September 17th, 1916, which is where we start this campaign. So I hope you guys enjoy, and um, we'll get in the aircraft. All right, guys. So here we are in the aircraft, and we'll go ahead and try to get her started up. We have a number of aircraft on this flight, and I am uh, actually the number four guy on my flight. And I have full right rudder going here. You got to be careful with the albatross because it doesn't have a lot of, uh, of uh, authority with the rudder on slow airspeed. So you really got to shove the nose down to get it to get it going. As you can see it during my takeoff there. Alright, so we're just going to go out to the uh, front, to the west. We'll be heading westbound this time. And uh, see what, see if we can find any any uh, enemy patrols out here. Alright, so just joining up on the flight here. And there's something really special about the Albatross. It's just, it's one of those aircraft that just feels right. Very easy to handle. Uh, the takeoff is a little bit challenging with the uh, lack of rudder control, but once you get it in the air, it's a very smooth and enjoyable aircraft to fly. It um, just has great characteristics, very stable, and um, I could see why pilots, uh, the German pilots, really liked it. Now, I, to my knowledge, most of von Richthofen's kills were in this aircraft until he moved on to the uh, do, uh, the Fokker D3 but certainly uh, I imagine this was a favorite of his so the interesting thing about Von Richthofen, of course he's a nobleman and he comes from a, a very wealthy family 
Uh, and it, it wasn't just about the uh, wealth, it was also that the family name, the, they were an aristocratic uh, family. Uh, so that might have brought a little bit of arrogance and, and kind of cockiness to him. But he certainly loved learning about uh, flying and tactics, and he devoted a lot of his time to rehearsing uh, tactics uh, and just learning from other uh, other pilots in the war. And von Richthofen, uh, part of the aristocracy is that he would go out hunting uh, for all sorts of game with his brothers. So he had a uh, quite a love of hunting, and he describes uh, aerial combat. Uh, as being very similar to that, except you're hunting, you know, humans. Um, he would talk about whenever he downed a British pilot, he would <laughs> he'd be satisfied for half an hour. But uh, one of the things about von Richthofen, uh, amongst the other aces, is that whole gentlemanly honor that they had, and they certainly would respect uh, other pilots. And it was seen as a almost knights of the air jousting type of thing one against one um, you can see that in the movie the Red Baron where they in the beginning scene they fly over I think it's a, a British funeral and they drop the reef into the guys uh, you know burial grounds kind of captures the the spirit of the uh, times And we're just flying over a huge cloud right now. And one of the cool things is you can actually, if the aircraft fly through it, you can actually see them disappear into the uh, cloud layer. And you can see a pretty interesting thing here. Uh, if you look at that blue little uh, line on the compass there at the bottom, that we have about, a f I think, five mile an hour wind. You can see how the the wind actually affects the aircraft. It has to crab into the uh, the wind there, and that's exactly how a real aircraft flies. Oh, looks like we got an enemy aircraft. Yep, that is a two. I think it's a two-seater Airco. Yep. Looks like it's a single bomber. Ah, oh, he's smoking already. Yeah. You can see the the gunner in the front there actually standing up, which is wild. That is pretty hardcore, this guy's shooting back behind the aircraft there. Probably holding on to the gun for dear life. Oh, he just jettisoned his bombs. This guy has no chance. The engine is really spewing uh, white smoke out.
and they are just desperately trying to escape at this point. It's kind of odd that this guy's by himself. Uh, I don't know if it's a uh, if he's a scout recon aircraft, probably. But uh, his wings are pretty tore up. It seems like this bomber is very durable. I mean, it's got hole gaping holes through uh, all of its wings, and <laughs> it's still flying. I think there were accounts of, the, of uh, pilots on both sides that would try to take down, a, especially the two engine bombers that were pretty robust, and they would literally unload like 500 rounds into the thing, and it would continue to fly. So that's pretty crazy. That guy's engine smoking. Oh, they came really close there. I think this guy's gonna finally buy the farm here. Nice, still in the fight. <laughs> wow, talk about epic. That was cool. His wings got clipped on both sides by those trees. Man, these guys are still fighting. That's awesome. Alright, so I just stayed high up here in these clouds. Just uh, trying to maintain altitude and altitude advantage. Alright, I think my... Uh, my flight leader's heading back to base, so I'm gonna head back out since I'm I'm solo by myself. Not a good place to be in combat. Look at that massive uh, front there, the trenches, unbelievable. And these uh, clouds just look really awesome. They're really soft clouds. They're not like wrecks, which are very um, kind of distinct and defined. And I think wrecks. For uh, Flight Simulator X came out with some what they called softer clouds, and it just gives it a more fluffy, realistic look. And these are beautiful, along with the ground textures down there, as you can see. It's just a gorgeous flight simulator. All right, so I'm basically following this road uh, just back to base, it goes all the way past that airfield to our our home base is in Valu. Of course, using the map as a uh, <laughs> as a little bit of uh, orientation. It's amazing how much lift these aircraft have. If you think about most modern aircraft, just have one, you know, one set of wings, and uh, this has two, and it just does not want to come down. It has so much gliding uh, potential. It just goes on and off forever, and the fact that they were so light as well. I have, I'm have i full idle right now and I'm barely... Uh, I have to kind of force the nose down to lose altitude. Alright, so the wind is coming from the uh, south. So I'm going to land... Uh, just south, straight into it. There's the airport straight ahead. I'm just trying to do some S turns to bleed off a little bit of the uh, little bit of the airspeed. So if you pull up your little gauges here, yeah, you'd have to turn them on in the uh, settings. But you can see that little blue bar. It says three, and it's pointing in the direction that the wind is going. Uh, roughly, uh, roughly southbound, but uh, now it's it's kind of variable. It's shifting a little bit, and you always want to land into the wind because it slows you down and also lets you approach at a slower, uh, slower ground speed. If you've ever seen uh, seagulls uh, near the ocean, just kind of hovering in midair, it's because the wind they're flying into the wind and. Uh, the wind, the airflow over their wings still allows them to fly, but 
with a, uh, they're being pushed by the wind at the same time. And so the rel relative to the ground, their airspeed could be zero. Um, but they're still flying. And that's the same, same way it works in aircraft. I'm going to slip it. Full right rudder. Man, this thing does not want to slow down. I mean, at all. Alright, stick all the way back. And one thing about the Albatross is it, it simply does not want to turn on the ground. That's even with full right rudder. You know, and these things definitely tend to weather vane into the wind. They don't really have a whole lot of authority. And what the aircraft does is wherever the wind's blowing, like I'll turn the nose to the right here real quick and just leave it alone. You'll see it want a weather vane back into the uh, into the wind. Alright, and that was Rick Tobin's first flight. Hope you guys enjoyed that and there'll be uh, uh, plenty more Rick Tobin flights to come. I'll see you guys next time.